the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We miss Carol's voice. <laughs> but they want to sing. We need that too. Yes. There's not many of you. If you want a sweet treat, come grab one. <laughs> Yeah, please. They are very sweet. Very good. I would get one because I'm going to be here for a while. So. Ooh. All right, so Tony is also Robert tonight. So we'll be uh, um, back and forth with him on um, these scenarios and taking notes as well. So you be just aware of that. Any um, changes to the agenda? Yeah, there's one amendment under personnel. Um, we had three sort of last minute hires here that I would like to go on this board agenda. Uh, so I'd like under under the consent agenda personnel report, I would like to add under new hires, a six, seventh, and eighth new hire. All three are associates at the elementary school. The three names for consideration that we would add via amendment, uh, if you're interested, would be Bernice Kitt. Kim Keeling and then Jennifer Murray. All three are elementary associates. Did you say Jennifer Murray? Jennifer yes. Murray, yep. So, any others besides that? So, I've entertained a motion to amend the agenda as stated by Tony. I'm make a motion to amend the agenda uh, under new hires as stated by Dr. Elsewhere. Is there a second? I'll second that. All those in favor to amend the agenda as stated, say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. We have an amended agenda. Do we have to approve the agenda? I believe we're supposed to. So now we'll approve our amended agenda. I will make a motion to approve our amended agenda. Is there a second? I'll second. Moved and seconded to approve our amended agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 No same sign. We have an agenda, so we'll move on to consider minutes, bills, and financial reports. I get the pleasure of giving this report tonight. Um, we reviewed the bills. There was nothing questionable um, in the bills. Um, one thing that we're working through with Estes is a, is a billing error. We're actually going to get a credit back on a billing year, which is a pretty significant one. Um, so that's always uh, glad those kinds of things be caught. Uh, certainly a lot of layers of protection there. Um, one unique thing <coughs> this month, you do have the um, backup set. You do have the dashboard that Robert always provides and prints. Um, in terms of my brief conversation with him, everything is trending as he would hope. I don't know that he feels any different than when we set the budget targets that he feels like we're still, still sort of right on track with where he expected us to be at this point. Um, one unique thing this month is that we do have the audit uh, included in the minutes, bills, and financials. Um, normally the audit comes to us over the summer and there's an opportunity to sit down with the auditor. In fact, the last couple of years, Mark and I and Robert met with the auditor done sort of an audit exit interview. We've met with the auditor this year, but it was several months ago. Um, the auditors this year were way behind schedule. I guess I don't know how else to put it. It had nothing to do specifically with our audit, uh, but rather just their office was um, way behind. And so they actually had to do something that we haven't had to do here in, 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 for a long, long time, if ever, but we had to submit an extension to the state auditor's office for our audit, which was approved by Rob Sand's office. Uh, and then we just finally got the audit back in final format here a couple of weeks ago. So um, in terms of comments, uh, you know, there's a lot, 70 pages of stuff in an audit. Um, the last 10 or 15 pages is what I'm always most interested in. Um, you know, there were comments that I think if you're a board member reading it and haven't been through an audit before, seeing things like internal controls and segregation of duties would be a major concern. However, I would tell you that that's a frustration area for me, and Mark and I have talked about this with the auditors several times, is that when you have one business manager and one office person, there's only a limited amount of segregation of duties and responsibilities that can be done without adding more staff. And so I feel like we've taken a lot of steps to try to clear that comment out, and unfortunately, they still stick it in there. And I'm, 
I don't like that, but I feel like it's kind of a cut and paste at this point in time. And this is still Fowler and Hinchlow's firm? It is. Yeah. Yep. Um, just a couple of other notes. Um, we did miss the need uh, for a certified budget amendment that was noted in there. That's something that we're going to have to watch closer. If by the end of the fiscal year we're trending above Robert's projections, uh, the code would say we need to go in and do a budget amendment, a budget adjustment. And we, did, we missed that opportunity last year. We can't do that again. We can make sure we're, we're more thorough on that. Uh, another note in there, <clears throat> yeah, early retirement plan that was approved for support staff, not teachers, um, was a $1,000 payments a year spread out over five years. And due to a mistake in the business office, there was a lump sum of $5,000 paid. So no difference in money, just rather how it was structured and how it was approved by the board. And so um, it should have been done that way. We made the decision that we're not going to go back and try to redo it. Uh, but really, that's just an attention to detail that we mistake. So, um, you know, I would, I would wrap up with the auditor did give us some auditors didn't give compliments, but they, they offered us some attaboys perhaps in terms of the extra steps the office is taking to review ledgers and, and go through the fine tuning of our open enrollment that was another one. And, and that's uh, the principals put in some extra time to help us review those things. All those things seem to be paying off. Uh, we're making great headway there, but the one that hangs me every time is segregation review. And I don't know what they expect of us. I put them on the spot and ask them. And still, um, just, I think that's always going to be a comment in the district size. So, and otherwise, well, he's not it. I always look at that in the audience <coughs> to not mention that if it's not perfect, like it's not their responsibility of our staff. And, yeah, it's their responsibility to say there could be a hole in that would cure. Yes. Right. So, yep. But I appreciate I'm watching Tony with this, and he takes this a whole passion, a whole um, commitment to try to make this audit as absolutely perfect as can be, and um, the goal of zero mentions. So I appreciate it. We're getting a lot better. You know, the, uh, I, I, we're making progress. I, for, for the first time in a couple of years, I feel good about our progress on our. I know it would make Robert terribly uncomfortable, but I will mention to the board, I feel like I mention this every year when we look at our audit, every five, six years, you should go out to the market and do a request for a proposal for auditing services. And Robert's had terrible luck in the past with other auditors and doesn't want to switch auditors. And if you've been through an RFP, just because you do an RFP doesn't mean you have to switch. Uh, but we are getting closer to the point where I think we will need to look at District 3 and a request for a proposal and see what's out there. You need to be in the PCMC school where I'm sure we can I don't know off the top of my head. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, I do. And it wasn't a firm he's had to do that. But I will tell you this, that the presents challenges right now. My wife's district went out. Uh, their auditing firm closed uh, with, with very little notice. And they went out to the market and only got one response. So <coughs> finding qualified auditors right now is about as hard as find it is to find Qualified welders, qualified teachers, and qualified film employees. <coughs> Overall, pleased with our audit progress, but there's still some work to be done. I would say, from an auditor's perspective, they have a really good reputation and a very detail oriented um, based on my experience with them at a CDA in the past. So, not a lot of grace, is what I think, from my personal experience. That's not a bad thing. Right. Every, every stereotype is check mark. But they seem very good, and it's to me it's good that they do enough schools that they know. So, any other so thanks for the audit uh, summary? Any other comments on the bills or financial reports? If not, I would entertain a motion to approve. Make the motion to approve the minutes, bills, financial reports, and the report of the 2021 district audit as presented. Thanks. Is there a second? Second. Second machine. Um, <coughs> the 
moved and seconded to approve the minutes of those financial reports and the 2021 district audit. Any further questions or discussion before we vote? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That is approved. So go into information only. So stadium construction status update. Thank you. I'll try to keep it brief this time. Um, I guess progress. We obviously had a lot of progress last month. Um, pretty much just what's next would be uh, whatever we end up deciding with the, I think DLR titled it the Trojan Terrace for the viewing platform. So we would have that left. And then we've got, I think maybe we did our punch list and I think we're only down to like two or three items left on it. So making good progress on that. Um, I think we're waiting on some like a uh, piece of door hardware that didn't function correctly, so we had to get a replacement come in and just some very, very minor items. So um, that's about that's about it for what's left. Um, door locks on the press box are still on. It, that, so that must be that's the door hardware. Right? Yeah, yep. Um, progress photos, I threw some pictures on here, just, uh, I don't know, ones that I thought were kind of neat. Uh, we've got the the restrooms at the concessions building, just kind of highlighting some of the the plus and logos on the doors of the bathrooms and behind the drink fountain. Um, got the, some more details here in the concessions building, uh, the canopy with the lights and the, the inside of the concessions building there. Um, got a couple photos of the front entry and looking out at the field. Um, let's see. We got the, we did get the press box for painted orange. Uh, that actually just happened on September 8th. Um, so that is complete now. Um, and then, yes, yeah, schedule update. Um, I didn't really have much for this, so I kind of had some fun with it. I just put on a picture of the, the sport that came the yeah. home over. Yeah, that's a good picture. And then that's my, that's my two boys uh, <laughs> with the mask out there. It was fun running into Ryan. I'm like, I know you. How do I know you? Yeah. <laughs> your casual attire. <laughs> yeah. They so it was neat. You guys all came. Yeah. 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 Thank it was, you. It was fun. It was a good, good turnout. I got threw on some pictures just that I took. Um, I don't know. I thought it, thought it looked uh, really good there. Um, then budget and cost control. Uh, this is kind of we're we're not quite. We're done with construction, but we have a couple of PRs still out there, so this will still kind of uh, continue to be modified a little bit, but we're very close to the end, and you can kind of see that um, our original contract amount um, with Estes plus all the primes was $4,917,283, and then after all the contract change orders to date, we're at $4,915,27. Uh, so, Right about, we had basically a lot of credits at the start of the job without engineering. And then we had all the change orders throughout the job and basically we canceled out. Mm -hmm. um, we do have um, some allowances left uh, with some of these uh, contractors. I think Townsend, Brooker, and Norris. Um, I don't foresee any changes coming up where we're going to touch those. So that would be a $20,000 credit back. Um, when we've got to close this job out. And so, um, yeah, that's, I guess, a quick update on that slide. Um, and then, I guess that's about it. Safety update, we didn't have any safety incidents, so that's good news. That's all. <coughs> Must be getting close to the end because the big boss from Estes wants to meet with you Thursday. Oh, oh does he? <laughs> I'm assuming Paul is the is a oh Paul Newhart yeah yeah Paul's yeah that's a big big process <laughs> yeah. yeah for sure so we'll let you know how that goes yeah <laughs> like so, any project just a couple of things I would note I took some notes uh, Friday night on my phone um, you know just a lot of really good feedback of positive vibes you know a few things like any project you're going to do a little bit differently and they range from some pretty important things like need for more seating whether it's the elevator viewing platform or and or bleachers on the other side um, and then some smaller things 
you know, we need an exhaust fan in the concession stand. Cody's on it. Outlets in the concession stand need to be beefed up. Cody's already got that done, it's my understanding. Recycling boxes for the cans. The after is going to do that. They've already got them out there. That's a super cool idea. Um, and then we got a game clock. Just things you don't think about it. The concession stand got so busy, they couldn't see the game, which we figured out <coughs> the case. They, they would like to know how many minutes and seconds are on the game clock so that they can kind of brace for their busy times. And so just things you don't think about. So ordered a $20 uh, clock off of Amazon that we can time up and synchronize and so on. But overall, I, I thought Friday night was just a lot of between the weather, the crowd, the, I love the student section. The first time we've got a student section in 10 years here, the band, the, I mean, the, everything was perfect. The win, that always helps. I just, it's me, and it may be me. I don't like it, but I think about like barriers to ever making this decision. Like, what's the crew? What's the certain people going to be able to stand on the crew? Well, I think that's kind of past, and I'm sure there's some. But actually, I think some of them found some pretty cool seats in mm -hmm. some areas. The six or eight lane thing that took forever. Well, it's going to be fun you now that this has happened. So, um, and I'm glad that. Telling you push for me. This, you know, I was more concerned about actually having a track but to go ahead and do everything. Um, it's the right decision. So I was going to climb out of that and told Michelle, just like the smiles on people's faces. And I know in a small community, these kind of things are the anchors of uh, social events and environments and pride and those kinds of things. So, it was fun walking around, talking to all the old alumni and the, the guys who just graduated two or three years ago. You know, they were just in awe when the lights started blinking and the music's blaring and everything. It was, it was a really cool atmosphere. So. Now, I may have missed this, but did Musco just add in some extra things that we didn't agree to pay for? Was that what I heard? Yes. That's cool. Awesome. I remember having a discussion about what we wanted to spend. I remember having a discussion on color, but I didn't know about the software. The people I were standing when the first time the lights started to flicker, they thought there was something wrong yeah. in the system. But once we got past that, I really sort of underestimated the impact that would have on the experience for me. I, I didn't think it was going to be all that big of a deal, but it's, it was really cool. Yeah. It's honest that we're just talking about one day more. Actually, it must have been similar to more at the racetrack, and I thought it was a waste until I saw the crowd react to it. And it's just amazing the crowd engagement with the fields. Anything else? I just wanted to comment to Ryan and his crew and team, and um, like with any massive project like that, there's always going to be bugs that have to get pointed out and, and a punch list. And, um, between her team and, and our admin, it was pulled together and it exceeded my expectations. I was prepared for a few more road bumps and exactly like you said, I walked out of there, and, you know, extremely proud to be a part of this community and district and board. So, thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, I talked to, I tried to that night and this week being in the community. Talked to a lot of people, get some feedback on what they thought has been uniform and positive. Um, many of them were amazed at what we were able to do with the, the constraints, you know, budgetary constraints we had. So, um, you know, and I'm, I'm just sitting there like, I was sure that this a long time ago because it is, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, and I think the crowd, you know, I know on how far back we can get receipts, but um, I, I talked to a couple of people who said they thought it was the biggest crowd since plus one for all was a big rivalry in the United States. We had had, I concur, I hadn't seen that many people at a, uh, so Monica Friday, he said the two common things that she heard was no ticket booth and how do you respond? Yeah, we didn't spend 174 dollars on ticket booth and no bleachers, no physical bleachers. So that's what I heard and understood. So. And for the record, if I'm not mistaken, when we chose not to do that originally, it was a spacing issue. Correct. Right. And so, um, you know, 
so that was why we didn't want to trigger when we didn't. Um, yeah, so, so they could that wonder. Maybe come up with kind of an alternative plan, you know, phase two, three, four, whatever that might be. I had somebody ask me if, if the focus from here was going to be the Trojan Terrace elevated area or visitor bleachers, and I I responded back really the focus is going to be a priority. And I really think by the time track season starts, if we can pull that together, I was supposed to meet with a bleacher vendor today. Happened due to schedule con change on their end, but I'm hoping by the next board meeting we'll be able to have pricing on the terrace, Trojan Terrace, as well as some, some additional sort of outsourced side of the scope of the project, similar to what the, the storage building would have been, just projects that would work straight with the vendor and, and see if we can fit something in there. I'm just eyeballing it, but I took some rough measurements based off our softball field, and I think we can fit four or five rows of bleachers and go 30 to 30 uh, in there and try to fit something in there with a little bit of work and redo some things. So we'll have some options. Something else that I know has been discussed and we're working on is the back bridge of the scoreboard. That would be my only added piece. It to is. Beautify our amazing project. Yep, and I've had one idea presented to me and I didn't like the look or feel of it, but really <coughs> other options and I just don't have pricing back yet. Yeah, but driving up West Street, it looks very unfinished. Yep, so for now, <laughs> one thing we're shorter is a basketball floor, yeah, fine right. arts auditorium yeah. in high school. There we go. So, nice. you guys take care of that. I'll be long gone, so I can get all through this. But you can't get those done until you do the first one, right? That's right. right. Can't wait to do all ones. Adam, this is a stupid random question that you guys need to be bothered with. But, like, do we have to buy something to smooth the field out like that, or does it just stay smooth? The rubber pellets. Oh, we've got two different devices we can pull behind and smooth the pellets out. I didn't remember us buying anything that comes with the turf. Yeah. Three level. <laughs> I actually would never have known this, but I was at Simpson College one day for a meeting. They were doing that. <laughs> so I, 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 I watched did not have any idea what was going on. So. Oh, I can't imagine just automatically all falls into this. If you don't do it a couple of times a year, yeah. that's where. They kick extra points is a good example. That area will become kind of a divot. Mm -hmm. You've got to redistribute the same pellets. So. All right. Anything else? Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Ryan, guys. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, item number two on information only APR conditions of learning. <laughs> so, before Tom and Gary start, you have the PowerPoint slides for both of these presentations. What I've asked them to do is kind of go through the annual progress report. Probably won't spend as much time on the conditions for learning survey, but uh, this is an annual report that the, the guys give, and it's just kind of a, a snapshot of a lot of different data sets. You want me to project it up? It's up to you. They've got the slides. I'll, I'll project it up for people in the audience, but go ahead. Okay. Well, thank you. I know. Most of you have been through this, Jane. This is probably your first one here on these, right? So. so in some cases, I'll explain a little bit more, and it'll be a repeat for a few of you. But I don't have it memorized, so I'll wait for 20 to project it. <laughs> bet you quite good at it. <laughs> well, conditions of learning I did like in July, so I want to have it looked at in a long time. Yeah, I did it. Uh, so the bulk of this will kind of just be looking at um, these bulleted items, our demographic and, and enrollment information, um, behavior. Gary and I will go through um, basically with his CRUSH program. Now he's tracking office referrals. I've been tracking office referrals for a while. So we'll uh, dive into that. We'll get into academics, which will take a bulk of this. So we've identified three big high stakes tests that we take uh, across the district. So fast at the elementary level from TK through six. I ready math and reading that we do through eighth grade in both uh, math and reading, and we'll look at results and growth. And then we've got several reports from the Iowa State Assessment of Student Progress, which is ISAS, formerly known as the Iowa Test of Basic Skills and various other names throughout the years. And that's taken just by our third through 11th graders. And finally, just want to finish up that we're obviously taking another piece to what we're trying to uh, 
gauge from our students, and that is that portrait of a graduate work that we've been working on for a few years now. So we'll just kind of touch upon that just a little bit, but we're still in the early stages with that. Uh, demographic enrollment information uh, down the bottom, you can see I took this from the spring student reporting in Iowa information from the Iowa Department of Education website. So uh, this is maybe not necessarily what we had in the fall, but it is what we had in the spring. Over on the far right, you can see how that compares to uh, state of Iowa averages when that's pertinent to that information. But the enrollment one is exciting. I have up there beds. Uh, um, enrollment is a tricky thing because you you have open enroll in and out, but basically beds, the easiest phrase I can use for you is butts and seats. So we had 780 kids as butts and seats. That's how that's the easiest way to call. It. So compared to where we were in 2021 with that, that was a significant growth. And I know Tony, I think at the end of today's stuff is going to talk a little bit about where we look to be projected, but I know in, in my building, we're sitting at about the same number as we were a year ago. So I feel like uh, we were netting quite a few kids, even though it's the smallest preschool I've had in my nine years. So we're still like, we've grown preschool just didn't. Um, in comparison, I had 2018 up there where we were at 761, and that was one of the, I think that was the highest in my eight years prior to this past year. So enrollment numbers are looking good. That's that's a nice thing. Uh, the next. Do you remember what the lowest number was in your eight years? Like, that 712 would be pretty close, I think. Yeah. With, with, so we, we've been, when I am God, I sound like an old man, but I am, so forgive me. But when I started on the board, I think we had, we were at 700-ish. Yeah. You know, and that's the, mm -hmm. maybe the high 600s. Did you, did you get 2013, probably? 2014? Yes. Yeah, it's probably yeah. pretty close, yeah. So, no, it's, it's sitting good. I know I did look back to um, my first year in 2014, and I... We are at about 430 kids at the elementary, and we were around 340, I think, when I started. So we're up basically 90 kids in that building. <coughs> um, we break it down a little bit into subcategories there. Um, students with an IEP or special education, um, this has been trending upward. So we typically were in that 9, 10, maybe 11 range. We're now up over 12%. That's pretty close to state average, um, but we have seen an influx of it. I could probably share, and Gary might add into this, uh, at least in my building, we, we've had a number of kids come from other districts that maybe did virtual learning or parents pulled their kids out because of COVID. And in many of those cases, we've just we've had a lot of kids that are behind. And so we, we've definitely seen a spike um, across the street at my place. Same for you. Yeah. Um, students receiving free and reduced lunches really stayed the same. I don't think across eight years we've veered too far away from that 29 to 33 or 34 percent. That's been pretty standard. That is below state average. I think sometimes people have a conception that we're kind of a high poverty district. We're not in comparison to the state, but we still have a third of our kids that are in some economic uh, hardship to the point that they can get qualified for free or reduced lunch. Uh, chronic absent. Um, what we mean by that is they've missed more than 10% of the school year. So that's about 17 days of school as it's defined by the, the state. Um, as far as average daily attendance, we're usually between 95 and a half and 97. So that hasn't changed a lot, but uh, if you look back at 2018, we were in the top 10% as far as attendance rates went at our district at 3.9%. Um, that's definitely gone farther south. When you look at only 30 kids hit that, now we're at 91. Um, very concerning. I mean, that's one out of eight kids missing a significant amount of school, coupled with one in three kids in poverty and one in eight kids with an IEP. Um, without getting into the academic side of it, you can imagine that we, we're going to face some challenges because typically those demographic groups will struggle on standardized tests. So when we get there, we'll talk about it. Our gifted and talented numbers really haven't changed a whole lot, typically in that seven to eight percent range, which is pretty consistent with state average. Um, and minority students is is kind of a growing number for us. It's not growing a lot, but it's growing a little bit. We're at seven percent now. It's funny because my son asked me that. And he said, how white is our school <laughs> out of the blue? I went, well, pretty white, but it is growing. Yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a snapshot of what our school looks like. Again, the state average is 24% minority, so we're still uh, just not quite anywhere near that mark. Maybe you said this: the chronic absences is pretty. So yeah, yeah. I would say, for example, when the COVID early, yeah, with the pandemic, especially 2021, you know, our protocols were if you're within six feet of somebody in the classroom, you know, you're out. We didn't have that last year, but still, our absentee rates went sky high so we, we just had a lot of kids that miss and you know various reasons whether that is COVID related or whatever but our, that, those numbers are a challenge anytime a kid's missing class Mrs. Pursun can share that I mean you're 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 lost you're going to come back to class whether it's been you've been out two three four five days or whatever the case may be and 
you know, now all of a sudden it's a, it's a challenge. And so when you're missing 17 days of school or 30 or 40 or more, because sometimes we have that. I do have a question for Gary and for Tom on that. Because I have a COVID year, I know my yeah. daughter was. We kind of give a free pass. In, yeah, she was in, <laughs> she actually got COVID, was in quarantine, and she had three different occasions she was home for her yeah. absences. So I would assume that she probably knows she could remote on that. But um, if we, do we have any idea of why last year we, you know, we, we had such an aberration? For that because that really does concern me because I think that's probably you know correlation with dropping out with yes just you know like everything think, I've ever read. So I still think, think the pandemic had a big part of that. Okay. Uh, I, I from, from my standpoint in high school you know, there were so many I'm sorry I but I feel like there are still very much people individual households that, that still handle it like when we were in the you yeah. know what I mean? Um, they still handle it. A sniffle, a cough, you know, respectfully so. So I think, in my opinion, we're still seeing some of that. Yeah, sure. I think there's some ramifications for that, for sure. I think about a meeting Gary and I sat in today with a family. That one of the comments that Gary made stuck with me is that the kid's going to be absent for some time, but Gary said all of their assignments will be online. You know, so we got proficient with some of this technology. The high school teachers, teachers Gary, are using Google Classroom still. You know, so in the past, where a kid would have had to get notes and books at home, and you know, we have almost all of our textbooks are virtual. All the assignments can be done. So I think there's some more precaution with staying home, or even perhaps in some instances, well, I don't kind of feel good today, so I'm just going to stay home and I can do my Google Classroom. I think it's one of the unintended consequences of coming out of the last couple of years. Could I just say something? I would say that part of it is also mindset because they got to the point where they weren't coming to school every day and now it's hard to come back. And that was really last year. You would see some kids and just say, oh, you just stay at home in bed. And I just, that's what that's a day. Yep. And I also want to say that uh, the high school viewpoint, you've had a number of athletes who've had concussions and they're doing much more with concussions now. So I have a student right now, my physics class has been out three, four days. It's going to be out a couple more days um, because he has a concussion. So. That's another reason why some of our numbers have been going up is because we're having the protocol for that has changed as well. So. All right, behavior data. <clears throat> this was pretty exciting, I think, for both of us. Uh, I've always said Pleasant Hill kids are great kids, and I know from the substitutes that work in our district, they often say that. I mean, we pay like $40 less per day to be a sub compared to Knoxville, but we have a lot that say they'd rather come to Pleasantville than, than some other districts they might be a part of just because our kids are really well behaved and so on. So this first one is our elementary um, office referral data. And basically an office referral is essentially a kid's written up for breaking a rule that's pretty significant. Um, down in the lower right, the Department of Ed basically tells schools that run kind of a PBI system, much like the, the crush program at the high school and like what we run at the elementary, that your behavior data should come out 80% in the green, 15% in yellow, and 5% in red. So I've kind of color-coded our information on the left with four snapshot years, but in the lower right, you can see our triangle. In my nine year or eight years, I guess, of data that we have, we've never been anywhere close to that low, so to speak. And they call that healthy. I would be in shock if we were at numbers like that. But uh, this past year was a great year. If you go to the very far left, that's our 21-22 data, data. Basically, 169 total referrals at the elementary um, that's kind of on the low side. I'd say 180 to 200 is typically where we're at most years. My first year was the one on the far right. You can see we had 334 referrals and 5% of our kids had six plus referrals. And some of those kids had 20 referrals. I felt like it was almost an insane asylum when I first came. I had no idea what I was getting into. And then looking back, it's like, wow, things are tremendously better. Whereas today, 1% have six or more referrals. And I can tell you that even those kids... I don't know that we had anybody really over 10. I don't, I'm not even sure that we even got that high. So it was, it was generally a really uh, positive year as far as referrals went. Most of our kids rarely ever have to come visit me for misbehavior. Out of that 95.9, I'm going to guess 92% have zero referrals, and it's just a handful that have one or two. Most of the time they figure it out and don't repeat. That's, that's some of the good stuff. So elementary referrals, I'll hand it over to Gary to give you kind of an update on the middle school, high school stuff. We kind of followed along with the uh... Tom does with the PBIS. In the previous years, you, if you remember, we've tracked more 
suspensions. Um, and we kind of changed it a little bit this year, went this route um, with our Orange Crush system. Um, this first year, obviously, for, for keep, keeping these numbers up here, but 184 referral um, total. Uh, if you look at the minor versus the majors, um, minors, most of the time, those are just uh, teachers taking care of everything in the classroom still. Uh, the level three is when it comes to me. Um, so I was very happy with our data there. Looking at the, the bar graph on the right there, it, Tom's it was uh, 80, 15, and five. Is that yep. uh, in the red? Ours was at, in the red was at two, a little less than two and a half percent. So that, that was, I thought that was really good. Um, what was interesting about that, and from my standpoint, and as we talk about it as a as an Orange Crush team, is the students in the red um, were nine students out of our whole population, seven to twelve. You know, and there, if you look at the total number of referrals, seventy of those referrals are from those nine kids. So I mean that, and that's and that's perfect data for us to use as a team to look at and make some uh, interventions with those particular kids as we, as we dig deeper into it. So I was very, very pleased with our data in, in the program. So. From my knowing that not to expose any names or any of that, but <coughs> what's the big data say that if somebody is nine or more habitually, the percentage of graduates that are in that same scenario, does that make sense what I'm asking? Like does it impact graduation rates? Yeah. yeah, they're at risk for sure. Sure, and that's why that's why I don't want to say target them, but we we specifically look at those and try to make some interventions, some more some more one on one um, time with the development of the building. It doesn't have to be a teacher; it doesn't have to be a coach. It could be uh, a custodian. You know, if they make an impact on them, we try to make um, get that uh, personal relationship built. To keep them here and to make it more successful for them. Super simplistic explanation for the elementary. Basically, if you hit that yellow zone for us, you're going to get one of two paths. You're going to either get check in, check out, which is in the day, you kind of have a pep talk, and then we track how your day went. At the end of the day, if you meet it, you check out with somebody, and it might be Mr. Card if they have a good relationship, it might be the classroom teacher, it might be me, it could be anybody. Um, that's generally for kids that have the skill but not the will you know you kind of have a motivational carrot so to speak and then the kids that don't have the skill usually we we gravitate towards our guidance counselor to do small group or individual counseling sessions to kind of work on the ability because some kids come to us without the ability to behave that's a hard part for some people to understand is you know they, what their home life might look like is very foreign to what it would look like in school so sometimes you have to have somebody to have a teachable moment and kind of go through this is what's acceptable so well, that's our behavior. I thought that was good stuff. Uh, <clears throat> academic is a little not as exciting when we get here, but there are some encouraging things, I think, when we get to the end. Uh, first academic one I want to point out is just fast testing. This was uh, created, um, I believe, in 2013. There was legislation once upon a time that third graders had to uh, read at grade level where you would hold them back. And then since then, they backed away from that. But the testing part, which is important, it's designed for you to catch kids that have difficulties in reading and basically plug in interventions and give them support so that they can get to a level of reading skill that will make them uh, you know, sufficiently strong enough at reading, I guess, for high school and beyond. 80% uh, is the desired goal for us or better than the state average. So when we go to the next slide here, um, basically this is what I will call fluency, which for our second through sixth graders, means how fast can you read in a minute and how accurate can you read? And for our TK, kindergarten, and first grade, it's more of the basic skills of learning how to read. So what does the sound F make or A make, which is A, and, or then you start plugging those letters together and what do they, when you put them together, what sounds they make or decomposing them. So uh, the top line is how we did last year in 2022 and the one behind it is just the year before. So you can kind of see uh, where we've been recently. Um, back in, I think, 2018, we were in the top 10% in the state. We had an 83% overall average. So you can see over on the far right, we did take a dip. We were at 72% last year. The state average was 66%. Uh, in 2021, we were at 76 as a school. 63 was the state average. 
Um, that year that we were in the top 10%, we were like at 83. Um, so we have, we have seen a dip. Um, again, I think there's several reasons probably um, for all that, but I know since about 2018, our Title I reading numbers have doubled. Our special education numbers, as we've indicated, have gone up. A lot of kids that have moved in. Uh, if Carol was here, it would be interesting because one day I was looking at the data and she happened to be subbing and I brought her in and said, check this out. 83% of kids that had been at Pleasantville for three years hit the benchmark or above. But if you had only been in Pleasantville for this was your first year, it was 47%. So it was an interesting number when you started diving into what was going on. So that's just uh, some of the challenges that we face. Quick question for you, Tom. Yeah. Um, with, our, with our overall going down over the past couple of years, which we've been seeing a lot, yeah. what was the state average? Was it 63? Was that the state average in 22 and, and 66 and 22? 66 and 63, 63 and okay. 21, yep. I didn't know if like three years ago or however long ago we were at 80 something, the state average was 63. And uh, always the around that 65, 66, somewhere in that name. That's normally pretty average. So 63 would have been a little bit of a dip coming off of COVID. It's now back up to more of an, an average number. I know in winter we were at 75, but for whatever reason when we took it in the spring, we just kind of fell off. I think at the end of the year, kids have just tapped out too. There's just lots of different things that all revolve into this, but you know, it's uh, it is what it is, and that's that's where we finish the year. So, any questions on fast at all? All right, our next one is I ready. <clears throat> this is uh, in conjunction with our math program that we utilize uh, K through eight. We have the I ready system that goes in conjunction with it, and basically, our kids take a diagnostic test three times a year. They take it in the fall, winter, and spring. And so what you're going to see on the next slide is elementary data and middle school data and elementary is on the left, middle school is on the right. And at the top, you'll, you'll see fall and at the bottom, you'll see spring. And what you want to see is the green number being close to that 80% mark to see that are we where we need to be. So if you look at the top, you can see that our kids came in after summer at the elementary, only 19% were at grade level uh, in the fall. By the end of the year, we were at 59 but our red numbers were at 19 and dropped to 10, which is below special education numbers. Typically your red students would match up with your special education numbers. So that was encouraging to see that a lot of that red went away. Uh, middle school's over on the right. Again, this is just math to begin with. So we were at 40% in the red uh, down to 23%, and then the green from 22 up to 50. That was math. The next one is reading. Same thing here, a lot of our kids came in, um, you know, just fresh off of summer, this is fairly typical, 33% at the elementary in the green and 20% in red, 38% in green at the middle school and 38% in red. And then you can see where we finished the spring again, 10% in red at the elementary and 67% in green, 47% in green at the middle school and 30% in red. So just kind of a shakedown of how that um, process works out. Those are um, tests that are done on the computer uh, individually by kids. And again, that's basically fall to spring results, how, how it shook out. So. Another cool feature that we get with iReady is we can look at growth. Um, can't always see that in a lot of other systems that we have to kind of track how our kids are doing. Um, what we want to see in the growth numbers, iReady has tens of thousands of kids that take this. So they have a very robust data set that they can dig into and see, you know, how much should kids grow based on the numbers that come in. And so 100% as the median is considered a good goal score for a school district and 50% of the kids hitting the growth goal that they have, meeting that growth mark. It's kind of what you want to look at. And you can see all of ours uh, were right around that mark or better. So for example, reading at the elementary got over 100% and over 50% uh, met. In the middle school, I get it at props to Greg Eichenberger. I'm guessing Melinda's probably watching. She watches every single school board here. So if she's able to let Greg know this. I want to give him huge props at the middle school. You can see the median score was 200% growth and 74% of the kids hitting the growth goal. So that is outstanding. Uh, just shows probably a lot of effort that he put into it. And, and not only him, but the special ed staff and anyone else uh, associated with it, Gary might fill us in at, you know, other people that probably deserve those props. But I know Greg coming over to the middle school and being very passionate about math, that was a nice thing to see a, a good jump there. So uh, ISASP is basically our state test and 80% uh, proficiency is the desired goal and again or better than the state average. We're going to look at the 80% stuff and look at our building data. We're going to go back to the three years that ISASP has existed so far 
And then at the end, we'll look at the state averages and how do I, uh, Pleasantville kids compare to the state of uh, Iowa kids. So this is mainly for Shane. Some of you have all seen this. The ISASP has uh, evolved over the years. Once upon a time, all of us older people took the Iowa test basic skills. That went away when the Common Core was, was created. And they created the Iowa assessment. So it was supposed to be aligned to the Common Core. And then eventually uh, federal law changed a little bit with ESSA. And uh, when they said that Iowa assessments wasn't aligned close enough to it, they created, well, we were going to go to what everybody in the nation pretty much uses, but we didn't want to fire a bunch of people in Iowa City. So we made up a new test called ISAS. Is that pretty much it, Tony? But I put that in not quite politically correct ways, but that's really what happened. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Uh, by the way, on my trips to Cedar Rapids for baseball, I drive past the Pearson place on that route, and uh, I have told Logan that if it actually lit on fire during the trip, I don't know anything about it and be vouch for me. Uh, so anyway, just a little bit about it, kind of a recap. Again, for three of you, you've, you've seen this before. The test is still relatively new, and they say that it'll take about three to five years to norm and give us kind of percentile ranks and growth examination. Uh, they've been coming up with some arbitrary percentile ranks just to help, but they're not completely reliable or accurate for sure. But just today at 2.12 in the afternoon, the growth stuff came in my email and I haven't had a chance to look at it, but it'll be curious to see what, what is in there, but I'm excited to see. Uh, when we got the ISASP, um, many of the Department of Ed um, figureheads basically all told us expect worse results and there's no doubt about it. Um, when we were taking Iowa assessments, I know at the elementary we had 90, 90, 90 in math, reading and science one year and I had to wear a unicorn suit. Um, we're nowhere near those numbers, and, and when I talk to other people from other districts, they're all in the same boat. They all, we all knew this was going to be harder, um, but that's okay. If it's linked to what we're supposed to be teaching the Iowa Corps, that's a good thing. Uh, what you may remember from the old test was that it was time. You know, you have 30 minutes, fill in the bubbles, time's up, put your pencil down. They don't do that anymore. It's now about knowing versus speed. It's not how quick you take it. They really want to know, do you know it? So it creates managerial challenges as principals to budget time and or if kids – you can't do all day, so eventually, but you'll have some kids that want to take all day, and so sometimes that creates, you know, finding people to help proctor those, but I mean, it works out. It's fine. It is what it is. Uh, the tests do now include writing. When we were just doing Iowa assessments, we were required to take reading, math, and um, eventually, I, I know we took science, but I don't remember. Did we have to take science? Eventually, maybe they made us for a little bit. Yeah, it was a state too. Eight and ten, and so it's five for us. But I think we, I think we took it third, fourth, and fifth grade, and sixth grade when we had them in our building. Um, but now writing is a, is a piece here, uh, sort of concerning as it's scored by humans. You can just there can always be variations, and how are people feeling? They might have felt really good at eight a.m. and at one p.m. after looking at the same uh, writing assessment, maybe just totally tapped out and not feeling it at that moment. So I don't know. It is what it is there too. Uh, it can be taken on the computer or traditional pa pencil and paper. We have done both. Um, this past year, we took it third through 11th grade pencil and paper. The year before, we did it third through 11th grade on computer. And in 2019, we did it pencil paper. They did it on computer. Um, I think we each have different preferences perhaps on that. I know the kids told me they like taking it pencil paper. The teachers thought they worked harder at it. And you'll see the results. Generally, I think our scores did uptick a little bit compared to the year before on computer. But uh, we never know when the state may at some point just say no more pencil paper. Uh, you're going to take it on the computer. So um, down at the bottom just tells you who takes what tests. Everybody third through eleventh grade takes the reading, what we'll call ELA, and then science and uh, math, and then science is just fifth, eighth, and tenth grade. Uh, we took these in April, mid to late April. Uh, we get preliminary results minus the writing. We did get the results back in July that had the writing results officially. So. This is, we've had this information for a while. We now have it ready for you to look at. <clears throat> so math, uh, this is the elementary side of it. If you go clear over to the right, you can see where we were in 2019. Three out of four grades got over 80%, which is our goal. Uh, in 2021, after the pandemic, that dropped to one, and we're still basically at that mark. But if you look at 2021 to 2022, we did see in most cases uh, some growth, especially going from perhaps taking a computer to paper pencil. Uh, middle school is the next one, or middle school and high school is the next one, same thing. Uh, we had one in 2019 at 80%, and you can see that in 2022, we now have two. So we were making some progress there, 7-11 uh, in middle, uh, middle school and high school math, whereas we didn't have any in 2021 to get to 80%. So a little bit of an uptick. It's good to see. 
if I go back, if we go back to that one, one thing I do want to keep in mind, we are looking, you know, at grade level bands there, but that's not the same kids. Just keep in mind, it's not always an apples to apples comparison. Every batch of kids are different. So, but you can do the math and go seventh graders at 85%, skip down a couple. <laughs> You can go, oh, they were 68 and 9th, but now they're back to 80 and 10th. That's a, a way to look at it if you want to. Uh, when it comes to the English language arts, reading and writing, um, again, middle or elementary, we had three over 80 in 2019. Pandemic hits. We come back in 2021, take it on computer. We got two. This year, we take it paper, pencil. We only had one. However, um, in a couple of those cases, it jumped quite a bit going back to paper, pencil for us. Uh, but that's a breakdown. Three through six, uh, seven, 11, kind of the same same story here. Uh, we had a couple in 80 percentile range in 2019. We didn't have any in 2021. We're back up to three. So that was exciting, uh, positive results in our ELA uh, middle school and high school. Science has been a little bit of a bugaboo for all of us. This will be our fifth, eighth, and 10th all combined here. Um, only once out of nine attempts have we hit that, hit that 80 percent mark, um, just kind of generally fallen in that middle of range 50 to 75 percent kind of area uh, quite a bit but uh, I know I looked at the fifth grade test I stood over some shoulders and I was <laughs> very impressed with uh, the challenges that these kids were having to go through on, on this test it was difficult I think I sent a screenshot picture which might have been slightly illegal to Tony and Gary and said what's the answer to this one and I don't think we ever could actually solve it so if you've ever wondered that game are you smarter than the fifth grader neither of us three were <laughs> and we know we don't even know the answer because ISAS doesn't send us the result. We don't even know what the right answer was. And we don't know. All right. <clears throat> the next part is hot off the presses a little bit. Um, what this will show you is how do Pleasantville kids compare then to the state? Probably the easiest way to look at that is the yellow is the not yet proficient. So our kids that aren't meeting benchmark. So this is third grade, as you can see in the top right. And we both have English language arts and math pictured here. But you can see where we were in 2021 in yellow and where we were in the spring of 2022 and then go down below and compare how did that look compared to the state. So you can see that the state in general had troubles in 2021 and we definitely did in third grade when it came to ELA. I know Tony's daughter was in that class. We had a lot of issues with kids doing one of the three writing prompts and then would hit submit and click done. You can't get back into it. It's over. So we had a lot of kids fail ELA, so to speak. It said they were not proficient. Um, Different batch of kids, but you can see compared to the state, um, especially in math, our numbers look really good, whether it's the not uh, yet proficient or even the advanced numbers. Um, but what a difference kind of a year makes in those results. Fourth grade is the next one. Again, same thing. Our, our results look better than the state. Again, we said 80 percent is what we want to hit or better than the state average. So we're, we're there in both ELA and math in fourth grade. In fact, very strong in ELA with that batch of kids on that particular year. Uh, fifth grade, we should see science in this one. <clears throat> uh, results weren't as good as what we want, but we did see some improvement compared to 2021 and kind of below state average. I believe we have two grade levels out of all of these. I think it was maybe fifth and one of our high school groups that may have uh, not met state averages overall, but in some cases they were there or right near it. Sixth grade is the next one. Um, yeah, this is another one that was just a little bit below um, the state average. So 28% compared to 31 in ELA and 43 and 33 in math. So we were not as strong as um, that. However, our advanced numbers were kind of going up. So encouraging information on some of that. Seventh grade um, saw a lot of improvement here. Again, 2022, 27%, 19 for us. It was 35% for the state and 13 in math. So again, we saw a lot of progress on the iReady. We see a lot of progress on ISAS when it came to, to math there. And our, and our advanced numbers went up. Eighth grade is one that's just slightly better than the state average. This would have been last year's eighth graders, again. Um, compared to the state, just a little bit better than the state average, but not by a ton. Uh, ninth grade had pretty good results. If I remember. No, very similar results to the state. Sorry. Tenth grade, uh, these numbers were really encouraging. Um, you can see 19% not proficient in ELA, where the state average is 27. Math is strong. We're about half or twice as good, I guess, when it comes to that number. And science is a little bit better than the state average. And then finally, 11th grade is our is our group that might have struggled just a little bit um, compared to the state average. 
um, but in ELA and math, just uh, slightly lower than the state average there. So that gives you at least a comparison of how do our kids stack up in relationship to um, state of Iowa results. We used to show you ACT, but ACT is honestly becoming a challenge getting information. And the re reality is so many colleges are no longer asking for kids to take it. And I don't know that the data is all as important as we once you know, used to share with you. It's just, it's just different times. That's probably the best way to, to shape that there. Colleges are replacing that with something or just nope. not asking? Nope. Many are not requiring it. I can tell you just from my daughter's experience that University of Minnesota where she applied does not require it. In fact, they told us unless you are, unless you do outstanding to have a relatively poor GPA don't put on there, or unless you want a scholarship, which eliminates most of the kids. And we were in Iowa City Friday, you spent most of the day there, and they are requiring it this year. Not, not requiring, I'm sorry. It is optional, although if you don't do it, you have to submit a written Say. Uh, it's, not, it's an essay, but it's more than that. But you have to do a writing, basically, while you're not doing it. But the lady you presented was really good. Uh, I feel like I've missed every college in the Midwest, and she's the best one. So she had to think next year I will require. Yeah, so, it's, it's it's becoming more frequent that ACT is not required for a lot of college entrants, like it used to be. This is a lot they said. <laughs> They, but they told us at, and I will say, at Minnesota State did not require it, and at Iowa, that they have found that the best correlation that they have to college performance is completion of four classes, completion of uh, uh, class rank, and GPA, and as opposed to ACT. Well, it is now kids that they can tell it for Yeah, and well, what, what the, the lady at Iowa, like I said, was fantastic, said basically the kid, and she said, we see this, who gets a 2 7 as a 30 on their ACT or 29. Well, they didn't care a lot about school, <laughs> but they're a bright kid. And so why are they going to care when they get to college anymore than they did it? It doesn't work wherever. Right. Whereas a kid who maybe gets a 15 or 16 on their ACT but does well, takes a lot of core classes, gets a decent GPA, has shown they can advance. That was her explanation for it. And she said, you know, that was what their data had shown. Uh, and not just theirs, but I mean, the people going on. And Minnesota just flat out, the guy just told us, unless she, she's outstanding on her ACT, leave it off. So we just got to, I don't know this, but got to make sure we know that the really elite ones don't miss an opportunity because I got a lot of college kids at 33, 34, and 4 around scholarship. Yes. Yeah, I think you get a high score, I turn it in. Years, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's the academic side of it. Just a reminder that we have uh, taken a dive into this uh, work with Portrait of a Graduate that we're looking beyond just the academic and behavioral side of it. We're really looking at those uh, five big competencies that we want our kids to leave Pleasantville School District equipped with so they can be successful in whatever life hands them because the work world's changing tremendously, technology's changing tremendously, you know. So being able to collaborate, communicate, be service-minded, be resourceful and have great integrity are just things that we think we want to make sure we shape with our kids. So beyond just some of the stuff we've already looked at, that's a big focus for us in the future. And we're really excited about the route that we're taking here. So uh, as we get more information for you, uh, we're going to be working on some professional development and dates that we're going to get together with our staff to kind of go through this work. But our goal is to track this information so it does show up on the kids' report card where they're at and hopefully show longitudinal growth at kids at improving in these categories because some kids may not be real excited about standing in front of other people like I'm doing here and having to communicate, but getting kids where they're comfortable and doing that type of stuff or working with others. So yeah, that's it in a nutshell. If you have any questions, feel free to ask now or catch me at any time. And I can definitely go through anything in greater detail should you want it. That was a lot. Sorry. <laughs> it's once a year. <laughs> no problem. Do you think we would have an update on still evolving. But. Yeah, so what we announced to staff at kickoff is that the district leadership team is going to continue to work behind the scenes through now in December, but we're going to do a soft launch with staff second semester with full implementation next year. Yeah. 
we really think all staff need a chance to take this out, get comfortable with it, particularly with what Tom just touched on. If they're going to be on some level assessing and evaluating kids on these things, they need to be pretty comfortable with it. And, and it's way different than anything they've ever done before, for a lot of them. Yeah, it's awesome. We've got to see it evolve. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Did you want anything with conditions and learning? So, uh, yeah, let me touch on that. And the okay. questions, Tom, uh, we can answer them. You've also got some slides, Tom, prepared on what's called the conditions for learning. Right? <coughs> I don't want to go through it at the board table tonight. What we will do is send them to you, and we'll have them. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, honestly, because I. I don't believe in it. Um, it's a survey that kids take, and it's a survey that has questions that are very pointed at getting kids to fill out the survey a certain way to create sort of a, in my mind, a fictitious crisis. And you've got every school in Iowa getting negative results on this thing. Um, so what I would encourage you to do as board members is take a look at the type of information that's in there. If you get questions, get Tom or I up on it. I just don't want to spend a lot of time on it. I don't want our staff to spend a lot of time on it. I just I think it's fundamentally pretty flawed. That's clear. Yeah, it, when you look at it, I think one of the things is if you see a percentage, just keep in mind that's the number of kids who said it was good in every question. So if you said no to one thing, that messes it up. That can make things look different. So if it said 29% favorable, and then 29% of the kids said all of these things, yes, our school district does that. But even if you said one, maybe not so good that that could drop the score. That's how long have you been doing that? Uh, I think it's our third year. That's yeah. right. Same time as the ISAP. I think it's our third third year. This is the first time we we kind of got the results last year, but it didn't make any sense. Like we didn't get a lot of detail. It was just a bunch of numbers. Now now we got to see the questions or the domains and where those scored. Yeah. That did help. Like we just set a goal with my PBIS team. Um, we feel like we've got so many things in place with similar to the crush program that the high school has that we didn't have a goal that we needed to set for that. We always do, but instead we took something from the conditions of learning survey, which was positive notes home, like communication home. And we've set a goal that each teacher is going to send three positive comments a week. We're going to set a goal of 2000 positive communications uh, to parents, because I don't know how many times I get those chances to see a kid's academic results and they knock it like the growth stuff that we saw. I love sending those to parents, like sending a screenshot and go, man, Joey just hammered this. That's so fun. And I don't do it enough. Like I just, so it's going to help me, but it's going to help all of our staff just try to catch those moments, whether it's, Hey, I saw them pick up trash on the playground or man, they were helping a sad friend out or, you know, they hammered something in this class. So we are actually taking something from the conditions of poor learning survey, trying to make it a better result than what we had. Cause I think we had 17% of the kids say teachers aren't, Telling, I mean, we praise all day long. That's one of our great things. Catch them five times doing a good thing. Every time you catch them doing a bad thing. And for the really hard kids, do it ten times. Catch them doing good things, and one time for the negative. Uh, but for a lot of kids, I mean, I feel like we're, we're giving tons of praise out, but maybe we're not doing it at home all the time. And so we've been more intentional for that in that perspective. So there can be some positives from it, but yeah, I think there's definitely some uh, quirks in that system that they've created that aren't 100% perfect. But and, you can get you can get something out of that. You can get better after. Well, if every school district, I guess we're one because every yeah. school district in the state of Iowa is having similar poor results to the student survey. What's the state education or the Department of Ed? Yeah, I know. I know your answer. <laughs> I just wanted to. Know. I mean, I think parts of that survey are going to be leveraged for some of the governor's safety initiatives, which I'm perfectly fine with. I'm happy for those. We're going to put that, those dollars and the, those opportunities to really good use. But, but some of this, I'm afraid, is, is really for political leverage during the next political campaign season, if I'm being real honest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's right. Just being quiet. But yeah, that's kind of what I'm worried. Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't that was, that's what that, that information is probably best being used for. All right. Well, thank you. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Gary or I about any of those areas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All right. So we will move on to communication from the public. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. <coughs> any communication from the public? Yes. Yes, sir. Well, a couple. No, 
Just a couple of things. My name is Sharon Spore, and I'm a resident here at uh, Pleasant Grove Community. I have been for 24 years. And um, first of all, I do want to commend the school system because our kids, um, our adult children, moved here about five, six years ago because of this school system and wanted to be closer to home. And they had checked into other school, I mean, they completed the schools. So uh, I, I want to thank you for all that. Um, this year has been kind of a little bit of a fiasco, as Mr. Roth knows, and, and I'm not criticizing. I would just like to maybe um, have you consider a couple of things with the busing system. I know that we have a shared bus transportation director, which I really don't know anything about that yet. But um, the first note that came from the school that they were not going to do in-town busing for the first two weeks. So everybody could scramble to do whatever they needed to do to grandparents, friends, or whatever to get their children to on the buses in town. Um, and thankfully for our kids, we're here to help. But um, the first day, the first day they did start running was the first Monday of the school, the start of school. And it was a late start, so my granddaughter, it was my responsibility to get her up to the bus and then pick her up from the bus in town here. Well, we didn't get to the bus at the time because we wasn't exactly sure at the time, so we just kind of guessed. So we had enough time to walk to school, but I was expecting her to get off the bus at the in-town bus stop that day. And so I'm waiting the bus driver pulls up, the four kids gets off, he closes the door next day, and we're like, the open store, you looking for somebody? I am. <laughs> She's not here. So my first thought was, okay, did she walk? I don't want to walk because I don't want to waste time, losing time, finding her. So I drove the route she would, I thought she would have walked and came in. And Mr. Roth and the staff were very good about helping me find her. Um, but taking from the comments from the staff, the thing was, Bus number 16 was not bus number 16 that day. It was bus number one. And that was not, that information was not given to the school, the elementary school. And bus number one, if it was going to be number 16, which it should have been, I think that they should have at least temporarily put big 16, just taped it on there just for the day. Because a lot of the staff was confused. They didn't know. Well, she ended up on another bus and got back to the school, but, you know, if you're going to do a, a switch at the last minute, at least I think it helped the staff so they can. Um, there were some other issues which we've taken care of along the way. The only other thing, we did have a substitute driver, I forget which day it was, it was the last week, I think it was. Um, yeah, and the bus stopped. And, no, the bus didn't stop. It didn't stop at all. And so she called Tom and found out that she was on the right bus, but the guy who was a substitute driver did not know that, that she was getting off it. So she rode the whole bus the whole route. She, uh, she's five years old. She's kindergarten. And uh, she was a little confused and upset. And when she seen me, she'd come running because she was she went first thing, I want this or I want that. And that's the way she is when she gets upset. But it's worked out. And I just would like to see that if you're gonna do a bus switch, especially early in the year, to have that driver or somebody put that number that it should be rather than just send a bus over and tell them about it. And one other thing I want to ask about um, up here on state and Jones, you have the stop sign at that one corner, the crosswalk. Okay, the traffic coming stay from the south going north, like right there at the school, they don't stop. So is there 
I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I know the stop sign out here at the corner of Jones and and. Yes. Well, this one would be one that's right at the corner. By the library, really right close to your office. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There is usually a stop sign there. It got hit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
All right, and then we'll move on to consent agenda. Um, personnel report. Yeah, so under resignations, you've got four there. Uh, just, uh, just something to note, obviously it's fairly evident with the one year notice there, but Robert's stepping away from junior high football for one year just as a part of his operational sharing situation with PCM. That was part of that discussion. Uh, the, the other three resignations, uh, I would call out Jeanette Brazy, I've been with the district, Tom, how many years? Uh, 23, 26 is an associate. Just a lot of service, a lot of kids impacted. A few years ago, we made a video uh, just going around interviewing kids. Who's a teacher that's or a staff member that's made an impact and why? And I always remember my daughter. Uh, I could, I was uh, I was honestly shocked. You know, she didn't name her teacher. She didn't name her coaches. Didn't name her bus driver. She mentioned Mrs. Brazy and had all these reasons why. And so super sweet lady, somebody that's, that's given us a lot of years of service. Well, We'll certainly miss her. Under new hires, just a reminder that we've got the uh, the amendments there under six, seven, and eight. Um, but then we've got a, a volunteer cheer coach in Teresa Mason. Um, just uh, while we're talking about cheer, and throw a shout out to Julie Cowden. I think it's the best our cheerleading has ever been. Uh, they're organized, which you know, Julie doesn't surprise you. Uh, they're having a good time. Uh, the, I, it's the best they've, they've been since I've been here. It's wonderful to see. You. Um, then uh, Tina DeMoss in food service, as well as uh, Francine Wilson in food service. We've got uh, Greg Eichenberger as a one-year interim uh, junior high football coach in Robert's Place. Um, and then a couple of associates that's presented there. This is a part of the consent agenda, so I'll move right into open enrollments, if that's all right. Yeah. <clears throat> and then just three in, three out this time. Uh, the, the three in, we had uh, Blake, a 10th grader from Knoxville. Uh, Zachary, a 10th grader from Des Moines uh, via Carlisle, and then uh, Madeline, a 10th grader from Knoxville. Uh, three out, uh, we're losing two to Southeast Warren that we've never seen before. Um, just due to a family move, they're on just the wrong side of the road, and then uh, a family that wanted to continue with the schools as well. So all three of our outs, Tony, are not, are not closing those Yeah, uh, Adelia is not a student we'd ever Adelia. seen. Has been a student oh, she has. but it's but the family is wanting her to go to to, to new so yeah okay I don't know a lot of details about it but okay. yeah she has been a student and it's the Mester the Mester family the, the one coming from the yes. Yep. Yes. yes yes yep. 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 so that's the consent agenda. Make a motion to approve the consent agenda. I just, I'm just curious since we're talking about Dr. Pay. How's that going for the editor? Let's, uh, we can just, we got a motion. Sure, so sorry. Let's, <laughs> I didn't know if I had to speak on this. Before. I'll touch on it in my report. Okay. All right. Sorry. So, we're just, we're sorry. Good. so I'll second that. All right. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Any questions or comments? Cover it right now. Questions are asked. <laughs> <laughs> it says it'll cover it later. So, okay, sounds good. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. So, I'm sorry about that, Jane. New business. I've considered, I've considered bids on Trojan Terrace Stadium elevated viewing area. I want to table this. Ryan did not get all the bids back in time. Uh, he had a you know, if he had an order of magnitude budget put together for it at 50000 um, and that would include everything except the railing system, if you read my update last week, um, at least one local bid has been very favorable. So we'll continue to chase that with another local vendor, too, and just see how it plays out. But uh, feeling really good about that, uh, but we'll need to table this for tonight due to the, the lack of bids. So we have to table it. Or the motion could die for a for a lack of motion. Seeing no motion, we'll move on to new business number two, uh, consider stadium project change orders. Yeah, so just two tonight. Um, one of them is uh, from DDVI. Uh, I get the numbers in my uh, agenda were not exactly right by the time the dust settled. It's at 3,374.95, so again, 337.495. Did you say that was DDVI's? Yes. Total. Okay. 
<coughs> yes, <coughs> GDVI. And then another one for ardent lighting. Uh, fortunately, they don't make this easy for me. And it stinks when I get them right before the board meeting. One thousand four hundred and thirty-three dollars. And the, spe the specific item there was um, the need for a garbage disposal in the concessions building uh, that was not in the plans originally and then the need for uh, additional electrical hookup for the air fryer that the district would have ordered. So any other questions or discussions? Do we take these together or the individual? I think you can take them as one motion, just as the change orders. Okay. So if I would um, make a motion to consider our saving project change orders um, or deep DDVI in the amount of three thousand three hundred seventy-four dollars and ninety-five cents, and ardent lighting in the amount of one thousand four hundred thirty-three dollars. Three hundred forty. Did I get one four three three? Oh, okay. 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 Sorry. Second. Second motion. Second. 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 So move and seconded to approve our stadium project change orders as stated clearly by Michelle. Any discussions or questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed same sign. Motion passes. So move, Mrs. Zane, their new business will move on to superintendent's report. I'll touch on uh, the sharing agreement just so I don't overlook that chain. Um, good question. I'm glad you asked. I probably shouldn't. I, I probably will just have that one Roberts back just be a standing thing and we'll give you an update on. But uh, I would tell you so far, um, he's found his niche with their office staff. Um, you know, as we noted when we were evaluating this, there's a lot of similar software packages. So that has made it nice where he can do some work. You know, remotely. I think he said he came up here the other night and worked in his office here, but was actually doing some things uh, over there. But um, he has discovered a little bit of a mess, just in terms of nothing scandalous, but just disarray. Uh, financial statements haven't been prepared like they need to be. It just um, it really took him three or four times of going up there before he felt like he was familiar with everything, making progress. Um, so I, I think it's like any sharing arrangement that's going to be temporary. Early on, it's probably more work, but I think that will offset itself come March or April once they've hired a new person. So probably right now, it's more of a pressure point for Robert, probably the last thing in the world he needs right now. But, um, you know, I, I do think over time, it's going to even itself out. Um, the next month or so for business managers is a really stressful time. It's a high stress point with what's called the Certified Annual Report or CAR. Um, Roberts has got ours in good shape. He's working on theirs as well, and he's had to ask for an extension, which isn't something that happens very often. So, uh, just I don't think he expected to inherit a well-oiled machine, but it maybe is a little clunkier than what he was expecting. It's very interesting to see what we're doing. Yeah. yeah. Yep. That's the. That's the scoop as I know it. I'll let him give an update. We'll set this as a standing for the talk through next during next month. Uh, I gave the board an update uh, on our enrollment. Nothing's changed since my update Friday. Uh, still appears we'll be up 20 something. Uh, Tom hit on a good point earlier. It's just enrollment's one of those tricky things. Don't count your eggs before they're hatched. Every year it seems like we get our preliminary numbers and then something doesn't match up. And there's seven or eight different categories of enrollment. And, some of them are, as Tom so eloquently put, butts and seats. Um, that's the one that matters the most. But then there's other ones that are really important for funding mechanisms because without a big school finance lesson, every student that's in special education generates a little bit more revenue for the school district due to the extra cost with special education. Every child that's in you know, different programming, there's certain programs that generate additional dollars. So really till the end, by, end of October, we'll know exactly like funding-wise what we're going to set. Um, that's why if you looked at uh, some of the notes here, in November, I've asked Robert to put that financial health snapshot together for the board and go through all the key financial indicators. I'm jumping all over the place on my, uh, my outline here, my presentation. But in November, Robert will present that. It'll include a look at our certified enrollment, our unspent balance, which is a really important financial indicator, our solvency rate, which is important. Uh, he'll look at revenues versus expenditures, salary and benefit ratios, and then negotiations, trends, and settlements. So 
good timing in November to do that. You're coming off the heels of when those big state reports are due. You've got enrollment in the book, so we know kind of where we're headed and what our scope, what, what our situation looks like. But then, believe it or not, you get November, December, and then the negotiations team starts meeting to start kind of coming up with a strategy in January. So there is some strategy there to have and present that in November. Kind of plant a seed with the board for something that I'm working on behind the scenes, but I, I think we're going to have to get creative with our recruitment and retention of bus drivers. Um, we need to do something to generate more interest. And I've seen some other districts start to do things. Um, we're fully staffed up right now, but I have one for sure, possibly two drivers that are going to retire at the end of the school year. So I'm nervous. Uh, we also are down to only two sub drivers. Um, and, and honestly, that's that's not even close to enough. So um, I've seen some schools get creative offering uh, to pay tuition. Uh, so it used to be when you took the class with the, D, uh, the DOT, you pass your uh, driving test and you're good to go. Now there's some pretty uh, cost intensive time intensive training you have to go to and that's after you've passed the four written tests and so a neighboring district has offered to pay the tuition for people to go to the two-day training up in mason city it's a thousand to two thousand dollars a person but i think unless we start uh, doing some things like that we may have a hard time recruiting people additionally some districts are starting to do a five hundred or thousand dollar one-time bonus uh, some have said we're going to give you the bonus as soon as you've driven a route some have said after you've driven 10 routes we're going to give it to you but I, I think it's time that we cook something up here and I'll, I'll plan to present that next month with some ideas on what we can do to incentivize this thing a little bit. Last few should be uh, quick hitters here. Uh, I've, I've been uh, nominated and, and elected to the Marion County Development Commission. Uh, I just thought it was interesting. I, I think you'll appreciate this. Their mission is to enhance the quality of life and standard of living in Marion County by promoting and developing Marion County as a quality destination to work, live, and visit. So I'm excited to be on that group. I was asked by Carla Ising. Carla is a wealth of Marion County information. And uh, I, I liked, I asked her, why did you ask me this? And she said the night they had their uh, leadership with Lake Red Rock group, she liked my passion for Marion County. So uh, I, I liked that. Honestly, I was, was going to tell her no, but then she told me that and I felt like <laughs> <so>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last thing here, uh, community usage policy. Um, we have a beautiful stadium. We want to keep it beautiful. Uh, so now but there's some question about how do we do that. And uh, I've done a lot of checking around. Joel's done a lot of checking around. Some stadiums leave them wide open. I think of my former employer, Carlisle, their stadium is open 24-7. Um, and they don't have any trouble with it. They haven't had anybody tear it up or ruin it or misabuse it or, or whatever. Um, other school districts completely lock them down. If you know me, my preference is going to be to leave it open. I think we promised and committed that to people when we built the thing. Uh, what I would like to do is go heavy on signage and expectations and clarity and then deal with it on a case by case basis. If we have issues, we'll have good camera coverage out there. In fact, I think the gentleman in the shirt that slammed the door. I think that's what he's working on right now. So my preference for the time being would be to leave it open to the community and not have a process. I had thought about a process similar to what we do with winter walking. So every winter we open the facility up, people can get a key. If it's locked down to a very specific entrance, they can only use it from this time to this time. And it's generally our elderly patrons that don't want to go to West Des Moines to walk the mall. We thought about applying something similar to the stadium where you can get a key or a padlock. My preference for the time being would be to keep it open and not go down that road. And then if we start having issues, we can certainly pivot and go that direction. I have it all typed up and ready to go if we would need it. But if you have other thoughts, we can certainly we can certainly go that route. Our board policy 9051 would apply here. Um, and it just says that the facilities we try to make them open to the community. Um, and my suggestion would, would be to not lock it down, but if we need to go that direction so I'm in agreement with that and I think we would get a lot of headlines if we did lock it down. Is there a technology that would lock the main gate at 10 at night to lock it at 5 in the morning? You can still get out if you were in there, but it just seems like 
surely there's automated scenarios where yeah. or the city could help us out and lock it at 10 in the morning. But I just like what nothing good's gonna happen at two in the morning. And That's right. Nobody <laughs> to, no, nobody's coming to walk, I don't think, at two in the morning. So yeah, sure, it sure it sure be nice if somehow yeah, would, would, it, would be locked. And obviously people still have to get out if it locked it at ten oh two and we get inside of it. But Yep. There was an item number five on here about possible service on a governing board for AASA. I have changed my mind. Anything else, Superintendent Wise? Nope. All right. Uh, yes. I'm sure if we, but back to that bus driver recruitment. Um, because I've been thinking about it. I've tried to get my dad to, to apply because he's, you know, retired at age. He has a CDL life, but, you know, he's driven a truck forever and ever. His issue is hearing. Is, you know, Tom can vouch for this in our family. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, anyway, but, you know, we've got a lot of retirement age folks in this community. So I think maybe even combined with that bonus or incentive, whatever that looks like, we do some sort of like marketing campaign to these people. Let's get a list. Who are our retirees, men and women? Um, gosh, I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking Tim and Val Schultz, you know what I mean? They're, they're still working, but I think they're on the horizon of retirement. And I think it would be phenomenal, either one of them. Yep, um, that, would, that, would, that would be amazing. Absolutely. So I just want to throw that out there that we need to <coughs> maybe get a little more creative on that kind of the marketing campaign piece of it and really drilling down to that audience that we're maybe wanting to target, I guess. The place where I lose a lot of good recruits because the Legion was my hotspot, right? A lot of them have CDLs. They're often very service minded. They're often retired. Right. And I had a bunch of interest until it was, you know, take four tests. And by the way, that's the, the class you've got to take is $2,000. And that's real. Sure. That yeah. And so, and I'm not yeah. probably jumping the gun here if I'm going to mention it anyway. Right now, you've got to go to like Mason City or uh, Davis County Schools as a, as a testing site. Knoxville's on the cusp of getting certified to be a testing site. Our new shared staff would run that, so I'm really excited about that. I think that would be a boon to be able to tell people that instead of going to Mason City, <coughs> maybe something comes together where the district offers some incentive financially, and you're, going, you're, day, you're taking a day trip to Knoxville as opposed to going to Northern Iowa. So they, your point isn't lost on me, though. Okay. And then on that note, um, relating to transportation and it doesn't have to be fully discussed now but um i'd like to have a further conversation and follow up on um you know our communication like our walking talkies or our radio system yep. you know, again i just think it makes sense especially if we're having a bunch of new hires you know potentially in the future that we kind of look at that and um radios are already ordered that's all i need to know though. and we're working out the kinks of our new shared arrangement it's different not having somebody out there full time and we've already found a few but even when we did there was always a few bumps every year where somebody stayed on too long or didn't get off the right spot so well and i think you know trying to reach our shared person at the most busy time of day that that person would be busy right in the school day and, and no no response like and part of the problem is she's time. oftentimes one of their subs and so from three to four, she's two or three times a week driving her bus. Answering her call and right. driving my kid no, either, but okay, so we got to figure out yeah. a resolution. What's <laughs> yeah. it? Yeah, just text it. Those are all legit. So. Yeah, I, her points are well taken. I don't think we can put a temporary number on a bus. I think that's illegal, but I'm going to check into it. Better, better communication, really, I think, is the ultimate goal there and just safety of our kids. So. Yeah, I think on that day it was a pull for an activity too, so I don't know if it's something that we look at different buses for activity buses. Or I don't know. We're, gonna sure do We're gonna start taking the same flat nose bus on every activity trip now. So yeah. But you know, if you got junior high going somewhere and high school going somewhere else, you know, that's something's happening. Yeah. I know on on, on our end, um, one of the nice things that when we used to do enrollment for students registering in the in the summer down in the cafeteria is that you have a place where parents can go sign up for buses and 
know what bus they're on and get, get their name down. We don't have that currently and with you know transition, you know, in that situation, there were so many things that were fluid that made it made it tough. And I'm not saying go back to that, but I think whether it's open house night or something, but having a transportation table where you have a team of people kind of take that information down. Because it is mostly the elementary kids that are writing and many of the little kids and it's confusing for them anyway. They don't know what 14 is. They don't even know that's a number. So it's 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 just some strategies that we need to look at at the beginning of the year that I think will make it easier. You know, having Doug who knew how things were and could seem to get a hold of somebody quick. But um, if I'm not walking down to see what bus drivers are here, and Deb Cook definitely isn't, you know, there were one of those situations I'm calling Celeste, not realizing she's on an activity trip and not answering her phone. And there's a sub there and I don't know who the sub is and now I can't get a hold of the transportation director and we don't have the radio to talk to somebody and it's it's a you know it's a nightmare. I mean these yeah. people don't know where their kid is and I right. go, I promise you your kid's safe. Right. That's what I'm gonna tell you right now. <laughs> well we'll figure it out. Give us give us a little bit of time and we'll we'll get it. But yeah having a, a couple things I think you know uh, we always have snap foods in the meeting year that does happen kids fall asleep on the bus and they don't get off with their eggs and that I mean they're worn out at the beginning of your sleep sleep routines aren't in place. Uh, but yeah I think just having Maybe some better systems to start the year, uh, but the radios will help as long as we can, you know, radio in and say, "Do you have Baylor on your bus?" Yeah. <laughs> oh, she's on bus fourteen. Good. Hey, we move her back. Yeah. Then we can get it quick. What about painting the bus on the side? Where each bus? Yep. They always pull up the same order, don't they? They do, but it was their first day. In this case, it was their first day. Uh, that was what we had. Yeah. But, about but we always have teaching. We also have associates out there from it. It's the same person, except when we have a sub. Yeah. Right. So we have a sub drive. You have a sub driver, a sub associate, and a substitute teacher in the room. That yeah. was one of our problems this yeah. this year too. Yeah. So I mean that happens, and so they don't know who's supposed to get on. You know, but we, we had a, we had a girl get on the wrong bus, and you know there's they just come lining up and they don't they don't know you know and right. the drivers don't know because it's a different they're a sub. Mm -hmm. They don't really know where the kids get off, and sometimes four-year-olds can't tell a driver this is where you need to turn. Right. And so they drive around and do their loop that they think they have, and so well, they can't take one of those turns. Yep. So it, it's a logistical. It can be a nightmare sometimes. So it's just cleaning that up. I think we'll fix some stuff. Yeah. yeah. Honestly, my hope a year from now is that we've got several changes made. One of them is going to be that when parents register their kids, they register yes or no to a bus ride question, so that we can plug it into a routed software. It's one of the things our new teammates from Knoxville help us realize is that our routes are really inefficient. Like we're looping back and that one back places we don't need to. And so a year from now, my hope is to have us situated where there's a process for parents to enter an address. It's, there's a question online for yes or no to, to route it. That's the plug-in to route it software. There'll be a cost associated with it, of course. But I want to Wi-Fi buses. There, there's just some modernizations there that I, I think we can the radios have been ordered, I think we've got four of them. So there's already one in our office, so there'll be one in Gary's office, Tom's office. It's fair, if something happens. So Wi Fi for the students to use? Cuts down on the number of discipline issues. Do you see a fire board somewhere? I'm surprised what you use. Bleachers, <laughs> Good. I mean, I, I could see discipline issues. And, for kids that are riding 45 or 50 minutes, if I'm in junior high or high school, you can get homework done on the way home. Or see that your fantasy football. Maybe there's some truth to that. Like, yeah. like it means they're all talking to each other. That's awesome. <laughs> just look at their device. My slime. Can we get little screens on the back of the chairs? Yeah. Yeah. Just like in bands. Movie. Play movie. movie. I did, have, I did have one thing right. I, I, I want to mention. I was going to email uh, Mr. Jordan about this. I just wanted to say I've had a, just a couple of deals with college admissions. I've been working with them. Fantastic. Um, huge help to me. Um, just learning all this stuff. But University of Iowa, UNI, Iowa State does what I'm sure these guys know this, but they do the <clears throat> Regents Admission Index now. They don't look at, you know, it used to be a few in the top percentage of your class you got in and all this. So anyway. Uh, my daughter now, you know, after we toured Iowa City, very interested in going to University of Iowa. Um, this is not, we 
she's also looked at Indiana, Minnesota, Minnesota State is different than those states do it. But one of the things they're like, wow, well, what classes qualify? Because it's based on a combination of taking core classes, your grade point average, uh, and then potentially your ACT score. Well, um, which which classes qualify for for this? Because you can take different courses that don't qualify as core courses, so they don't help you. Um, I had no idea, and M had no idea, so started looking. Uh, Johnston lays out every class they offer is an RAI or not. It also they also lay out for NCAA eligibility and something else. Ogden. These are our classes. This is how you know these are RAI classes at Ogden High School. Cam, which is tiny, uh, had a list. I don't know that it was entirely updated, but they had a list. These are our classes that qualify for that. So something if Pleasant Oak could do something like that, I think it would be a huge help, certainly to a parent like me and for kids in planning um, their futures uh, on that because there are some things that surprised me that they did qualify. There were some things that surprised me they didn't qualify um, on that. And, you know, if your kid is a you know, four-point student with a 30 on their ACT and all that, not a big deal, but it, uh, you know, they, again, I'm going off of the lady who told us University of Iowa. Uh, Iowa is getting harder to get into than it used to be. And uh, that, you know, a kid, the difference of taking, and this is not just so everybody's on the same page. I learned this all this week. Essentially, this isn't you have to take four years of Spanish. That's a different thing. It's how many points you get for taking these classes, and that's at you and I, Iowa State, Iowa. Um, you know, you have to you have this, and if you get two forty five total score based on their index, you're automatically admitted. They can't turn you down. Um, the way it was explained to me and you know, friends go to you. Graduates from UNI, UNI is a little more flexible the farther down you get. Uh, Iowa, a little less flexible. The farther, you know, if you don't qualify right off the bat, you might have to wait, you might have to jump through some hoops. So, uh, and and uh, Mr. George was really good about getting some stuff. But I was, I guess I shouldn't say this because I was like, oh, Johnson, yeah, of course they did this. But when I saw Ogden laid it out, Cam laid it out, you know, when I just Googled it, what are these classes? Uh, it would be really nice if we could do that for our kids and parents. So. Yeah. Okay, you you it's just passing the class then? No, it's, it's, you have to pass the class, but yeah, you get uh, like course science classes, English <laughs> classes, math classes, um, social science classes, but um, like M could, uh, is taking personal finance, and I, that doesn't count for anything, basically. Except you have to have good. Yeah, yeah. Graduation the practice. State right. Says the, state says the state says you have to, but I'm saying that, yeah, and I'm not denigrated because she took, you know, other classes that just don't cut it, you know, and then there are some, because I actually talked to this a friend of my son, just got, is a, he works with the athletic program on, on admissions, and, uh, and he, he told me, he said, yeah, we have a lot of confusion on this because it isn't this about how hard the class is, it doesn't fall, fall into the top. Fall under one of these categories. So, you know, and then you get changed, right? You know, well, we're doing that for a while, three or four years Right, and they're going through that because it used to be if you were the top half of your class, you got it. And class rank doesn't factor at all. That's no, and that's not like it's an Iowa State doing that too. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, it's, you know, it, and it helps. Well, like him, it's like, hey, I better take not because she felt she had to take it. She's like, just to be on the safe side, I better add in next semester on our AI class and just be good shape. That's interesting. Did they tell her she couldn't wear a jersey in the front row? Uh, no. Is the quarterback still on the jersey? They, uh, no, she, she's, uh, she's quite uh, vocal during the game. I will say that for a reason I can really talk at that, but not. My dad was. Found it on Sunday still, so that was <laughs> <laughs> any, other, any other reflections or comments or things you want to see in the discussion in the future? If not, then I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Move to second to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Both same sign. Motion passes. Thanks for being here, folks. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for what you do. Yes. Another round, come on, elementary, 7.30, PTO. Okay. Grab a sweet treat. We are spending a lot of money. So you know, we're spending a lot of money. <laughs>
Thanks for the treats, Michelle. Yeah, so you're I, welcome. I, 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 I would happily send some home to you, but I have to make the myself. You've ever seen it? Right. But uh, well, there's one reason or the other. You know, in time. You did have more time. Yeah, I already got to see that. Did you get one? I have. You have a treat? Okay. Indiana requires. I have a banana one. It's very good. Oh, you got to take it. Yeah, good. Yeah. It's See, good. Indiana State does not. And I think that's Thank you. Good to see you. I got a stack of it. Yes, you do. I got to see Shane at Heidi in the morning the other day. Oh, no, 